And thank you all for joining us this afternoon uh, for our monthly Tuesday talk. I am William Stroller, the curator of exhibitions, and I'm here to introduce today's speaker, Nena Aturu. Nena is a rising junior at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She is a double major in history and American studies with minors in archaeology and migration. She serves as the advising director for the Cornell Historical Society, has interned for the History Center at Tompkins County, and has researched the history of museum collections of the British East India Company as a Cornell Nexus scholar. As a Mellon Mays Fellow and Cornell Humanities Scholar, she is interested in how research, public history, historical preservation, and critical thinking can shape American public school history curriculum and who has power in the narrative for social change. This summer, Nena interned with the museum as part of our efforts to reinterpret the Louisiana Gallery. Last year, the Louisiana Daughters initiated a change to their gallery, shifting the focus to highlight the contributions of various cultures and ethnic groups throughout the history of Louisiana. Nena's goal was to begin identifying those groups, their contributions, and some objects that may be useful to discuss these groups further in the gallery. Nena's internship was made possible by the Decorative Arts Trust Ideal Internship Grant, which focuses on inclusivity, diversity, equity, access, and leadership and strives to improve access to curatorial careers for students of color as a path toward achieving systemic change in the museum field. We are additionally grateful to the Louisiana Daughters for their financial and moral support of this research, including a week-long field trip to Louisiana. We are especially thankful to Cheryl Gott, Louisiana State Regent, and Bobby Foster, Louisiana DAR State Curator, for their incredible support throughout this process. So thank you to both the Decorative Arts Trust and to the Louisiana Daughters. Uh, and now I'd like to bring up Nena Achur. <laughs> okay. um, hi everyone, thank you William for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here and share what I've been researching for the past 12 weeks. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nena Churo. I am the ideal intern for the DR Museum this summer, which is sponsored by the Decorative Arts Trust. Thank you. Um, I am a junior studying history of American studies, as William has stated, and I'm just really grateful for this internship as it has been really enriching and allowing me to expose myself to public history, material culture, and creation. I was really interested in interning here because I wanted to engage in a history in a way that reconsiders and includes all narratives, especially marginalized ones. So through this internship, I was able to highlight these marginalized and general narratives in Louisiana, which really is a melting pot state with so much culture and contributions from various groups, not limited to, but including enslaved Africans, Germans, Haitians, the Spanish, and Acadians. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have been involved in reinterpreting this gallery to better include uh, the contributions of the state. Um, well, here is a little map of Louisiana for people who may uh, want a little bit of an idea of what the state looks like. Um, so this is the state of Louisiana. It's next to the states uh, Mississippi and Alabama. And what you see here are the different parishes. Um, we went on a week-long field trip to Louisiana. And so we started out in New Orleans area. We went a little bit up to Baton Rouge and saw a lot of different plantations between those two cities. Um, the research sort of happening at the start of this um, research experience was really helpful in helping reframe in framing the research and what we were looking for in re-envisioning the Louisiana exhibit and what it could look like. Um, so as you can see, the bottom, the south of Louisiana is really close to the ocean. It's close to the Gulf of Mexico. So when the colony of Louisiana started off, it was really great for ports and trading and uh, just being a great area for commerce. Uh, the US, French and Spanish have all had um, some type of ruling period in Louisiana. The French had the colony in 1682 up until Spain governing the colony in 1763 and then a little bit for a month in the uh, in the early in the early 1800s the french took back control of this colony and then it was ultimately handed to the us in 1803 during the louisiana purchase um so so as you can see um louisiana has a lot of 
blending of different cultures and you can see it even in its architecture. This is a picture um, of some Spanish and French influence architecture that we saw in the French Quarter. Um, you can see that because of the different ruling periods, a lot of the French, uh, a lot of French architecture stayed and then when the Spanish came, they came and put a little bit of their own influence into these buildings. You can see that there are a lot of small vertical windows and side doors and a lot of intricate details on the railings and on the windows um, and scallop legs, which are very French um, in nature. Um, a lot of other things that we also saw when we went to Louisiana include the historic Herman and Grandma House, the historic New Orleans collection, the New Orleans Jazz Museum, the Gallier House. Um, this is a little bit the interior and exterior, which I will go into later. Uh, we also saw the Whitney Plantation, the Laura Plantation, and Louisiana State um, Rural Life Museum, and the Capitol State Park Museum, and the New Orleans Museum of Art. So we were really able to talk to a lot of different curators in these spaces and get an idea of what kind of work they want to do um, in the museum hall down in um, Louisiana. So through visiting these museums, we definitely got a better understanding of these different experiences of rural and urban enslavement, the ever-changing term of the definition of Creole in Louisiana, and ultimately how the culture of Louisiana can't be shared through objects from distinct demographics or groups, because through going into Louisiana, we saw that each object is really intertwined with many cultures that led to the blend of music and food that we see in the state. So we came to the conclusion that objects uh, that would be great for the Louisiana Gallery would rather reflect, reflect the merging and blending of Louisiana's multiple cultures. And um, I will talk about the groups that all contributed to this mixing of cultures and really that's the only way to see Louisiana. For views, this is the Laura Plantation and a panoramic view. Um, so the first group I will be talking about um, is the indigenous groups of Louisiana. Oh. Um, in this trip, it was very interesting to see how different foodways and crafts were created by different indigenous groups and contributed to um, Louisiana culture. A lot of indigenous groups reside in Louisiana and some moved out from to Oklahoma or some moved to other nearby states due to white settlers and uh, conquest. But some of the groups of indigenous groups of Louisiana are included but not limited to the Caddo, the Washita, and the Chitimaca. Many of these groups are known for their basketry and weaving skills. Uh, for example, the Choctaw migrated to Louisiana and, um, and created cane baskets that they used with Spanish moss, and they used it for clothing and torches, and they dealt with, they dealed uh, these baskets with um, different European explorers that came into the area. Uh, the Chitimaha in St. Mary Parish um, made single and double weave baskets in traditional patterns, which include the chain link and alligator and trails. And the Koashati of the Allen Parish also were in the basket weaving industry, creating pine straw and river cane um, baskets, as well as ceremonial masks, which they, which they still do to this day. Okay. Um, so here are some examples that we saw at the Louisiana State Museum of different patterns that these groups created. You see the River Canyon and you can see the Chitimaha. And these were um, shared with different um, Europeans that came into Louisiana at the time. And there was a little bit of a trade going on at that time. Uh, indigenous groups also contributed to Louisiana in food ways through rice, herbs, and corn. Um, ground safafras were used to thicken gumbo, which is a really big staple of Louisiana's food culture. They also taught Europeans how to fish and they traded with the French as I had previously stated. Uh, another group, um, the Hilma, lived in the marshes and the bayous of the La Forge Parish and they practiced fishing and trapping. And a lot of these groups, including the Homa, created um, dolls and bags out of a native palm called palmetto um, and also out of Spanish moss as well. Um, there is a unique group of indigenous um, people in Louisiana, which um, is considered a mix of African, indigenous, and European ancestry that was created around the 1800s. They were English speakers with Anglo names, so they were not directly um, part of the Creole culture in Louisiana, where most Creoles were French speaking and Catholic practicing. But they were an isolated community that raised cattle and did timber work in Western Louisiana and were therefore both culturally and ethnically isolated from um, white settlers um, and the conflict that would come with that. Um, here's another picture of a ceremonial mask used by the Chibi Maha. 
um, and some more um, designs and hats and bases that um, these indigenous um, groups contributed to. Um, with the different ruling periods of the French and the Spanish, there had been conflict with uh, the Europeans and indigenous groups. For instance, the French took over the Natchez land and communities. And even when the Spanish came back into power, they tried to improve relations with these indigenous communities and the displacement that followed. But it did overall lead to a decline in many communities, including the Natchez and the Acapujas, and, and a need for survival. Some left to migrate to the Oklahoma, like the Caddo, or some merged their different communities as one for survival since there are so few left in numbers. The next group I will discuss um, is enslaved Africans. Um, enslaved Africans arrived in Louisiana in 1719 through the Atlantic slave trade route. And by 1785, because the port was such um, a, a direct access to the slave trade and increasing numbers. Slaves were half of the population of Louisiana by 1785. Uh, many of the enslaved Africans came from regions that were known for their particular skills. So a lot came from Senegambia where they were really great in grazing and cattle raising. Some came from other parts in Africa where they were known for growing specific crops or house building or iron working. So with these various skills, the enslaved supported and created the economy of wealth in Louisiana in the sugar industries, cotton industries, indigo industries, rice industries, and more. Um, most of the enslaved, as I said, came from Senegambia, but others also came from the Guineas um, and the Yoruba in Nigeria. Some were also Wolof and Bambara. And with all of these different indigenous groups from Africa coming into Louisiana, a new collective black culture was being formed in Louisiana, though some people felt stronger roots to the African, um, their African um, country or their African um, place of origin rather than the new culture that was being formed in America, but it was honestly just a blend as time went on. A lot of other enslaved Africans came from the French West Indies, or which is also known as Haiti today, if they were not born in the US. And because of that, a lot of them brought with them the Creole French dialect um, from the Caribbean. And a lot of them also practiced um, Catholicism over there as well because of the French influence in the Caribbean at that time. Um, those coming from the Caribbean though were originally from Dahomey, which is now the Republic of Benin and Nigeria. So the importation of slaves and uh, its trade grew, and even when this trade itself was illegal in 1803, there were still illegal trades happening and coming into New Orleans, which still overall increased the African population and overall the cultural exchange that followed. Um, in creating their own cultures from religion to food, uh, the enslaved combined their widespread African religion uh, known as voodoo with Yoruba roots, uh, with the dominant Catholic religion um, that was happening, that was booming in Louisiana. Their practices were rooted in healing and had indigenous and Saint Dominique influences as well. And in creating their own religious and dance services, they created their own community um, on the plantation for um, slaves that lived on the plantation. They created their own um, wedding ceremonial um, practices, such as jumping the broom and changing the words of a uh, wedding ceremony until death or distance do us part, since it was very common for the enslaved to lose family or be separated from their spouse or their children at any given time. So adapting to these conditions and creating a culture, creating um, meaning in different things um, was a way of um, maintaining that community. Um, other things would be uh, barbecuing pork after a day of labor in the woods or visiting other plantation farms um, during Christmas time if their family or people that they knew were um, a few miles down the road. Um, but some uh, people, some enslaved would try to stay with their families by acting mentally insane or sick or to avoid being sold under cold noir, which was a French um, rule, um, rule book that determined how slave, um, and the enslaved were sold and the laws of reading and writing and whatnot. Um, most of this enslaved were baptized into Catholicism under the French rule. And so it is through these baptisms um, that were done under the church that we can find records of family or children, especially some that had um, a, white, um, a white owner and a um, black enslaved woman. A lot of the, um, a lot of the records can be found through these baptism records. 
Um, the Enslaved also created new music genres like Zydeco, which is a Creole music genre, which influenced French songs and Black rhythms, um, and later led to Delta traditional blues, country blues based on you know, slave songs, and ultimately the explosion of jazz in the late 1930s um, with prominent figures like Louis Armstrong. Um, so the food that Louisiana has to this day is very much influenced by enslaved Africans. Um, a lot of the food that was created as um, a result included um, okra, gumbo, um, okra, black eyed peas, gumbo, rice and beans. Um, and this picture is from the historic Herman Grandma House. And this is basically a cookbook that is being opened out. And since under the US rule, the enslaved were not allowed to read, the mistress of the house would come into the kitchen and read the instructions to the enslaved um, cook and tell them to memorize their instructions so that they could cook the lunch and dinner and just the meals for the day. So the cooks have to have really great memory and um, skill, but they would sometimes forget or have to improvise with time. So a lot of them added their own African culture, their own ways of cooking into this. So they added their own spices and leftover meats. And um, with this, it led to a lot of the food that you see um, in Louisiana today. Um, okra, watermelon, yams, rice, black eyed peas were brought from the um, African continent in the 1700s and grown in plantation gardens and ultimately made its way into the kitchen of um, onto plates that would later be served to the family. And big uh, named cuisines that were created as a result were rice and beans, jambalaya, crawfish etouffee, dirty rice, bodin, and gumbo. Um, this would be part of the culture of letting things simmer over a long Sunday or gumbo being made of leftover meats and ingredients and just trying to create something that would suffice for the week or so. But it has now become a huge part of Louisiana's culture um, to this day. Here are some pictures of some really great food. Um, these are black eyed peas. You can see some sausage and some meats in there. And then that's crawfish etouffee, a lot of rice as well on the side with them and a crawfish, which was very um, native to the region of Louisiana. Okay. Um, enslaved African women were sellers in goods markets um, in, um, in the US. And it is something that was also done back in Africa as the Wolof women in Senegal were, um, were um, also used to being um, like being um, sell, selling their own goods or crafts or their work. Um, they're also brought from Senegal the custom of marriage where um, a Senegalese woman could be emancipated if she married um, a free white French man in the 1600s. And as a result, her and her children would be free as well. And so this culture came to Louisiana as well where a lot of um, a lot of enslaved women and their children could be free if um, their um, owner freed them and their children um, because of their relations. Okay. Um, just a little bit more depth into the difference between public, I mean public, um, the difference between um, plantation and urban enslavement. Um, you can see here that this is um, this is a hallway and this is a structure used um, in urban enslavement where there were um, really a, like a high degree of surveillance for the enslaved. Um, there are two hallways you can see, and those doors lead to individual rooms. And um, there's only one flight of stairs that leads to these hallways. And it was a way for the um, for 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 enslaved people to be surveyed and have any and lower any chances of resistance or organizing to resist. Um, even though there is more arguably movement in urban environments, there was still that degree of surveillance. So we just wanted to show the architecture of that. Um, inside, um, there was definitely a lot more space and a lot more um, material uh, decoration and just more um, space and comfort for an enslaved person, but it did come with a degree of surveillance and a degree of um, just just higher, higher degree of surveillance, um, which is in contrast to the plantation life where a lot of um, enslaved people might sleep in just this one bed um, and also just be surveyed in a different way. So this is at the Louisiana State Rural Life Museum where there are, uh, there are different cabins on the si either side. 
and this is the main house, the, the POV. And so when you look out, there is still that degree of surveillance, but um, yeah, so it just varied very differently in those two environments. Uh, one thing also to note is that uh, those in urban environments were able to go outside of the house a lot more frequently to pick up ingredients. And so they interact with a lot more uh, different people. They could maybe talk with um, free uh, people of color as well, maybe find ways to resist, but it really was a tight schedule as they were expected to be back at a certain time or they would have a lot of eyes on them on the street, even though those in urban environments did have more mobility, it was still very um, surveyed. Um, and even though they've had a more livable or comfortable lifestyle. Um, it, it just it just shows different contrasts in environment. The plantation life was very labor heavy. And um, even when uh, um, the end of slavery um, came, it would be really hard for those on the plantation to find other work opportunities because their work is very rural and very specific to rural life. While those in urban environments had domestic skills and other skills that were more flexible for them to go and find other places to work as well. Um, all right, so the next group I will be talking about are uh, the Canary um, Islanders from uh, a Spanish island off the coast of North Africa. Um, they came to Louisiana um, in the 1760s and 1780s. Uh, the government actually paid for these islanders to come to Louisiana to offset the numbers of French people in, these, in, in Louisiana and also to help them escape their own environmental disasters on their island. Many of these islanders live in the St. Bernard Parish and um, also settled in towns, Galvestown, Valenzuela, and Barataria um, during the rule of Galvez. So Galvez was a huge sponsor for these islanders to come to, um, come to Louisiana. Um, the isolated, this community is pretty isolated, but they have been part of uh, Louisiana's formation and were really um, important, played important roles in different battles, like the 1815 Battle of New Orleans. Um, and a lot of their culture includes a lot of different arts, such as palmetto weaving, creating wood birds, and building boats, and dancing, as you can see from this picture. Okay, um, the next group that I will talk about um, is the Free Black People of Color of Louisiana. Um, many free people of color, especially Black people, came to Louisiana after the success of the Haitian Revolution um, during 1806 and 1810. Uh, many actually went to Cuba first, but the Spanish kicked them out, so a lot of them headed to Louisiana, and some of them with their slaves. Uh, the free Black population definitely had a lot more mobility. They had more rights. They could own property in the city and, fr and, and free other um, enslaved people with their money. Uh, a lot of them worked as butlers, overseers, cooks, cleaners, drivers, and vendors. Uh, many Black people that were free had legal rights as well, like suing and testifying against a white person in court, having legal marriages, and maintaining innocence until proven guilty, and a trial as well. And though they could not serve on the jury, um, they could, though, though they could not serve on the jury with these rights as well, um, a lot of them did have to carry papers to show that they were free unless they were white passing and weren't confronted in that way. Um, many enslaved people did not have these rights and would be tried for a crime regardless um, if brought by their court, brought by their owner, and did not have those um, innocence until guilty um, privileges. Uh, so what you're seeing here are Tignans, which um, communicated status for both enslaved women and for um, high class um, free black women. So the lace collars that you can see on this portrait of a free woman of color um, from the New Orleans historic, uh, historic New Orleans collection um, communicates a high economic, social economic standard standing um, and to actually keep women, uh, black women from expressing themselves and their social standing, and also just to stop them from showing their natural hair. Uh, the Banda de Policia Un Buen Gobierno of 1786 was enforced, it was under the Spanish rule, it was enforced to prevent black women from wearing extravagant feathers and jewelry on their um, tignins and um, were more so pushed to wear tignins that were very, um, that, were, that were not delicate, that were very, um, that didn't communicate any type of um, social standing, high social standing. Um, so the tignin that you see on the left is one that an enslaved woman would wear. Um, it would be wrapped with a knot in the forehead to communicate that they were of um, enslaved status. And this was really enforced during the 17 and 1800s. Um, but regardless of that law, 
many free Black women still continue to wear elaborate tignins and tie them in even more elaborate ways um, compared to the simple knot that you see on the left. Um, during the antebellum period of the 1850s under American rule, a lot of immigration of free Black people became limited or banned because of the looming um, because of the, the looming civil war. Uh, many were even forced to leave because the free black population rose to 80%. And a lot of people saw that as a, a lot of white people saw that as a threat or trying to, or a risk of their enslaved, um, of the enslaved trying to resist and rebel as there were a lot of revolts and rebellions happening up until the civil war. Um, they tried to lower the manumission rates, which means to like allow, to emancipate slaves. And so in certain ways they, um, required a slave to be at least 30 years old, but that was kind of systemic because a lot of slaves did not live till 30 or would live up until 30 because of the hard labor. Some of them um, had to have jury permission, but we know free Black people couldn't um, serve on juries, or um, even when um, an enslaved person was free, they would have to be out of the state within a year, but it would be very hard for an enslaved person to find a new community or find people that can help them adjust to this new way of life. And so some of them would end up going back to their plantation or going back to their owner. So they really made these rules hard to lower these success rates of manumission. Um, however, under Spanish rule, it was definitely less, um, death, less rigid than the U.S. Um, slaves could purchase self-purchase uh, for their freedom, and because of a lot of interracial relations happening at this time, um, owners there was there was less barriers for allowing owners to free their mistresses and children um, that made up the state's population as mixed. Um, um, one more family that I'd like to talk about, or group of people I'd like to talk about, is the Matoyer family. Um, they were uh, Black um, plant owners, plantation owners, um, and the enslaved Marie, or Coin Coin, was freed by her um, by Frenchman Claude Thomas. Um, they had um, two children together, Pierre and Nicholas Troyer, and they all ran the Melrose Plantation with over 300 slaves in the 1830s. Um, it was about 300 acres. And um, this was just an example of, um, of um, Marie finding freedom through um, a white man and um, freedom for her children as well. Um, so this was just um, a phenomenon of placage and concubage. Um, that Black women could use to gain freedom and protection from a white man of high status. Um, families would be started as a result. And um, so um, one more thing uh, on free Black people is the religious aspect of this. Um, a lot of them tried to find peace in a religion, in Christianity, but in a type of Christianity that did not uphold slavery or justify um, the uphold of slavery. So the St. Augustine Catholic Church was founded um, in 1803, and that is the oldest Catholic church founded by free people of color in the United States. Um, so um, I will talk about other groups that migrated to Louisiana, and those include the British Americans, the Italians, the Greeks, the Chinese, and more. Uh, these groups contributed culturally, of course, um, and a lot of them also did contribute greatly to the labor market and the workforce, especially after the emancipation of enslaved Africans. So trying to replace that workforce that went up north or that went, um, that, that, that went north. Um, so Italians came to Louisiana in the 1790s and 1800s. A lot of them came from Sicily in great numbers after reconstruction to fill up this job market, especially in sugar. Um, and with this community, they worked in businesses and they found um, let, uh, work in rural agriculture. Um, Another group that came um, in the 19, um, that came were the Filipinos. Um, here um, is the Manila village. It's a fishing village uh, located where St. Bernard Parish is now. And it is likely that the Filipinos came in, the, in 1763. Um, and they were the first Asian group to come to Louisiana. And they came on Spanish ships um, during the Spanish colonial rule. Um, and they were fleeing uh, the Spanish during um, they're fleeing the Spanish during that time and also just seeking new work job opportunities. And a lot of them also did serve um, in the Battle of New Orleans and War of 1812 and other um, battles at that time. But this village was set up on stilts and was like a floating village and very um, reminiscent of the Philippines, um, it was said. Um, they took part in the shrimping industry and brought methods like shrimp dancing to deal with um, 
breaking down the shrimp and selling it. Um, a lot of these um, Filipino um, fishermen um, interacted with the Isleno Islander communities and Cajun communities. And so it overall contributed to Louisiana's multiracial culture. Um, this village lasted until 1915 because a hurricane came through and destroyed the area. But um, it was really um, a place where you can see um, um, Asian culture coming into Louisiana early on and um, strides being made in the fishing and shrimping industry and just a blending of different cultures. Um, so the next group that I will talk about are the Chinese that came into Louisiana. Um, a wave of them also came after the end of the Civil War and during the start of Reconstruction, and a lot of them came to um, fill the numbers in the sugarcane workforce um, and caught in workforce now that um, a lot of enslaved Afri uh, previously enslaved Africans were moving up north. Um, many came as contract workers in the 1870s, and some came from Cuba, but some came from China. But those from Cuba had cigar businesses, um, so they would come to Louisiana and just continue those cigar businesses. Other businesses that grew were laundromats and curiosity shops that had um, that had silk and ivory and other fine, um, fine things. Um, food that they brought from their culture included fish, um, tea, and rice. And a lot of um, these Chinese communities established Chinatowns where a lot of um, white and black and just general Louisiana, people of Louisiana would come and take part in uh, Chinese food or culture. Um, so that was a way during like, the 1910s that a lot of people were exposed to Chinese culture. Um, yeah. Um, next are the Irish of, um, of New Orleans. Um, a lot of them came to New Orleans in the 1840s and 50s, along with German immigrants. Um, many of them were leaving Ireland because of the potato famine and the economic disaster of the Napoleon War during that era. Um, earlier in the 1800s, a lot of them did leave to avoid Brit British persecution and political takeover. So a lot of Irish people did come in waves and left for different reasons. A lot of Irish immigrants came as architects. And so what you see down at the bottom right is the St. Patrick's Church, which is in the city of New Orleans. Um, a lot of them also went into the rural life uh, and agriculture, and a lot of them make up the upland area of Louisiana, um, and they're known as Scottish, Irish, um, Protestant practicing farmers, and um, they work with other Germans, Cajuns, and Islanders um, that are also in that area. Um, it is also said that the Irish immigrants influenced the Louisiana accent, and um, as you walk through French Quarter, you could definitely see a lot of Irish pubs. So they did contribute in that way as well. <laughs> um, so the next group um, are the Jews of Louisiana. A lot of them came um, during the Spanish rule, but Cognor tried to deport some of the Jews because they didn't practice Catholicism. And um, so it was hard for them to build um, synagogues and places of worship for them um, when they came to New Orleans. But a lot of them persevered and still continue to build that community for themselves here. A lot of them uh, became businessmen, philanthropists um, in the city, and um, even came as traders um, from, Spanish, from Spain and Portugal um, in, the, in the early um, 1800s. Um, and later into the mid eight in the mid 19th century, a lot of them did come from Western Europe um, and then later came to be part of the Cajun community um, and trading for um, with the Cajun community. Um, they're also the Hungarians of, the, of New Orleans, of Louisiana. A lot of them preserved their culture and came in the early 1900s and mainly worked in the mill and strawberry industries. Um, and then uh, the Croatians also from Eastern Europe came in the 1800s, a little earlier than the Hungarians, but also dominated the uh, oystering industry and can be found today in the Black and Mines Parish. Um, there were also British Americans that came from the Upper South, so states a little bit above Louisiana, and they came down into Louisiana after the purchase in the early 1800s. They brought with them their Protestant religion um, into this established Catholic area. And they also brought enslaved Baptist practicing African Americans. And so this was already a cultural exchange um, with enslaved Baptist practicing African Americans mixing with French Creole enslaved Africans, um, and then also just British Americans bringing in the Protestant faith. Um, so a lot of these um, British American ran their own plantations. Uh, 
the cotton in the north. Um, so here is the Winnie Plantation. Um, the Winnie Plantation was, is located on the German coast, um, which points to also a huge influx of Germans coming into Louisiana in the 1720s. They participated um, in different industries um, in agriculture, and um, the German coast has the name because there was a line of plantations just owned by many German immigrants upriver from New Orleans. Um, they fled to Louisiana during the Napoleonic Wars during 1820 and 1850, and the economic problems and food and famine problems that came with it. Um, a lot of them also came in the 1860s following the German Civil War and um, came on this coast and um, created um, their wealth from that. Um, many Germans contributed to Louisiana culturally and um, with the accordion and different instruments in Cajun music and that genre of music. Um, they also introduced beer into Louisiana's culture as it was more affordable. Uh, than French wine as the French um, started to make wine very expensive in that area. Um, next um, are the Acadians. Acadians come from present-day Nova Scotia and off the coast of Maine. They were French immigrants in the 1600s, but were put into exile um, for, by the British for their neutrality in the French Indian War in 1755. So a lot of them came from up um, near off the coast of Maine into New Orleans and also from Britain, France, St. Dominique, Canada, um, during the 1760s and 80s um, and created a new Acadia. And so in creating their community, they established the Cajun French dialect. Uh, Cajun is actually a Creole word for Acadian. Um, and Acadian in Creole is spelled Acadian with an I-E-N. But if you remove um, the first A at the start, it's a Cajun, but like in, 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 in Creole. So, that's where the name Creole comes in. It is different from, or Cajun comes from, and it is different from Creole um, as a term. Um, the architecture, the home uh, of the Acadians is very humble and very simple. Um, this is um, some interior of the Acadian rural cottages. You can see that it's very modest. A lot of them use mud and Spanish moss for their houses, which I mentioned earlier in this talk was used by indigenous people. So that is a little bit of some exchange um, happening there um, that they used to build their houses um, and the exchange um, so you can see the exchange of materials in the in this house structure. Uh, Acadians also spun uh, spun and wove and created quilts and um, created crafts um, using palmetto and Spanish moss and everything like that. Um, they also um, created um, with um, they also used an indigenous method to help uh, protect their houses from rain, which is by covering their houses in palmetto fronds, which is what a lot of indigenous groups use to protect their um, to pr to protect their structures. Um, and so that's something that they use here as well. Um, Acadians married French, uh, Spanish, Germans, and um, Anglo. Uh, Saxon um, people, and so that was just another cultural mix that was happening there. And these people were obviously generally French speakers um, as they came up from Nova Scotia, French area. Um, so to talk more generally about Creole culture, I talk a little about Cajun culture and like where that came from, but Creole culture is really what makes Louisiana, Louisiana. Um, and this term has evolved over time, but now um, there seems to be more of a consensus of what it is now, but um, Creole includes the food, the music, the like rice and beans I was talking about, the gumbo, um, the Zydeco music genre that I mentioned. Um, and a lot of it is really just tied to this culture and just um, uh, blending of different people. So the word Creole is Portuguese, so it comes from the Portugal language. Um, and it was first used to describe Africans born in the Americas, but then it came to describe both Europeans and African descendants that were in the Americas, because to be considered Creole back then, it was like you were French and you were born in the US, you're different from the French from France. Um, and so there was that distinction of just, I am American, not American, but I am um, not native French. Um, so to be considered Creole back then, you were an inhabitant of Louisiana and you spoke the French language and you were of the Catholic faith. Um, but in the 1800s, um, so that was just used to separate those that were English or British Americans. Um, free people of color also use the word uh, Creole to separate themselves from the enslaved, but now enslaved Blacks uh, were also considered Creole as they contributed to the culture, spoke French, 
um, practice Catholicism and also just brought a lot to Louisiana culture as well. So following the Civil War, uh, to be Creole meant that you had some French or Spanish heritage, but also African or indigenous heritage. You'd have to have all three or all four. You'd have to have one or two because it really is just a different mix of people um, from this area. Um, there is really um, more emphasis on culture than race and ethnicity when it comes to who is Creole. Um, but uh, generally it's just more of if you have a Catholic background or um, French or Spanish heritage, but really it is just more about the food and the music to this day. Um, it could be argued that the emphasis on race and the emphasis on a heritage was influenced by the Americanization of Louisiana and how they made those distinctions, but um, it's more argued, at least going to Louisiana, seems more of like a cultural food music um, type of distinction. Uh, so what you can see here is a Creole uh, plantation, a Creole design. You see that there are a lot of bright colors um, and the interior, exterior is very different from the other French designs that we saw. It's very colorful. The entrance was actually um, in, entered into the bedroom to show the guests that you were very comfortable with them and that you were uh, just very open with them. They had big galleries, um, a hipped roof, they had asymmetrical rooms and double doors. Um, so that's just a little bit of what the architecture um, in the Creole sense looked like. Um, but other than that, um, I do want to slowly conclude this talk and sort of come back to what we see for the uh, Louisiana Gallery. Um, these findings and research have been like really informative and in, in helping us reimagine this Louisiana gallery and how it should reflect a blend of Louisiana's culture because it really can't be compartmentalized by African Americans, French, German, Acadians, and so on. It is truly a blend and it's reflected through African influenced food and music, French architecture with a little bit of Spanish culture in it, and even the names of towns in Louisiana that have indigenous roots like Baton Rouge. Um, these are some examples of uh, the blends that we see in Louisiana and that we would want to bring to, um, to, to this museum. Here is um, indigenous poetry written in French, and that just shows the influence of like, when you're considered Creole, you spoke French or um, indigenous people writing about their experiences in poetry. Like it's just a mix um, of Louisiana's culture right there. And then uh, the one on the right shows a floor plan for the St. Louis Cathedral by uh, designed by a black German French speaking man. He, um, his mom was part of that system where he and his mom gained freedom from the, um, from, from the white owner. And he spoke German, he was from French he was Catholic as he built the St. Louis Cathedral. So it just shows just, even you know, in that one object, just like how many different cultures and how many different um, experiences are in one thing. And that's really like what reflects Louisiana and that just shows the blend of just all these cultures and Creole culture in general. Um, other things we saw were chairs and furniture pieces that showed um, Mexican mahogany and American styles being influenced together. Even pieces that were um, carved by um, by cars by the enslaved. Um, in this Herman, this Herman Barma house, this pillar was um, was carved possibly by um, the enslaved. So just seeing where everyone's hands are in these um, in these spaces. Um, this is from the Louisiana State Museum. That's the Mexican mahogany chair I was just talking about. But um, just seeing that every object really in Louisiana is a blend of different cultures, and just um, and just seeing that in person and going to Louisiana was very enriching. And so I think that's something to consider and a theme to really preserve for the uh, Louisiana Gallery here at the DAR. Um, but overall, it was a great trip. It was a great research experience seeing how history is um, being changed um, and it's in the way it's talked about. And also just the tours themselves were very informative and a new way of learning about these things. And so, um, yeah, thank you for this talk. Uh, thank you for um, listening. And I'm really excited to see where this goes um, in the next few years. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you all for joining us. Let's see if I can and share. Yeah.
Um, we'll now take questions. So if anyone has questions, I'm gonna switch spots. You can stand here yeah. so they can see. Okay. Uh, if anyone has questions, please let us know. If you are online and have questions, please share those in the chat and we'll go ahead and answer them. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, so the question was, if I personally had um, any um, ancestry relating to descendants of African-Americans and the question, the answer is no, I am not. I'm Nigerian-American, I'm first generation, but um, yeah, I was just really interested in seeing how um, in the American context and the Black context, the, the Black experience and just like how the past still relates to the present, whether it's through ancestry or just through systemic issues that we see today. So the interest that I have in just living in America and just seeing the Black context, the Black the diaspora and just seeing in this context um, was also why I was really drawn to this internship. Um, and just learning more about it. Um, so the question was, um, what were some places that allowed me to, that I, that I enjoyed seeing and like the way they talked about history, right? Yeah, okay, so I was going to mention the Whitney Plantation as well. I think it was very um, brave and bold and something that needs to happen at more museums of changing the perspective of who you're talking about. Uh, the Whitney Plantation focused on the perspectives of the enslaved. We, um, we saw, we even heard, I think it was the Federal Writers Project. Um, they had interviews from descendants talking about their time in enslavement before um, the Civil War. And just hearing those stories and hearing the audios of it really added to the experience of just how brutal and how inhumane the whole practice was. And even when talking about the code that you mentioned, they did mention that if someone ran away and came back, they lost an ear. If they left again, then they lose a limb. And it just intensified each and every single time. And so I definitely think it's, it's because it's horrific, it doesn't mean that it should not be talked about. It needs to be talked about. And that's also why I love history and want to see how the narrative is changed. Um, another uh, place that I enjoyed the way they were talking about history was the historic Grumman House. Um, I never really took a look into urban enslavement the way they looked into that and seeing the experiences of them and just their work experiences, the degree of surveillance that they had, and just different from the plantation life, which I think is way more talked about than other forms of enslavement was something I appreciated as well. And again, it was a focus on the enslaved. It was a focus on their contributions of running the house, the people that were behind building the family's wealth, the people that were behind all of that. And so I think it is very bold for museum, the field of museums to be doing that. And I want to see that happen more. And I was just really appreciative of those perspectives and um, sharing those histories that aren't talked about. So, I'm going to take one last quick question here. Okay. Yeah, um, so for me, oh, oh, what do I plan on doing with this research and my experience here? moving forward. So for me, um, I'm taking a class next semester. It's actually um, about the history of Louisiana. And there is like another trip to Louisiana um, during like the winter term. And so just adding a more onto this research of like the different cultures of Louisiana and more on the black experience and experience of free um, black people and free people of color, I think is something I'd want to explore more in that class. Um, and just seeing how museums can change their tours. And I think that was really something that I took away from the project, just the way people are talking about it and the way these tours are being restructured. Um, I think that's a really great reflection of like how I would wanna see education like restructured or how things can be told also just in a different way. So I'm excited to see what that class will bring. Um, going to the same thing would be really nice. And sure, I'd love to see the daughters again too, but um, yeah, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just really happy with the direction I was seeing in Louisiana of like how the narrative is changing and we need to talk about these histories, whether it's comfortable or not. And like, just give, yeah, justice to that. I do have a question. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Nana, for sharing your research with us and thank you all for joining us. A recording of this lecture will be available on our YouTube page uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you again to our sponsors, the Decorative Arts Trust and the Louisiana Society of the DAR. I'd like to invite you to join us next for our next Tuesday talk, which will be uh, held virtually on Tuesday, September 12th at 12 noon. Uh, that is Leah Lane, curator of the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. 
and she will be presenting her talk by Women's Hands, the creative work of female artists in the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. Visit our website for registration information and thank you again for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.